I was, I am an inventor, and I invent transformable objects, and, tra and really typologies of transformable objects. And it was really after I graduated for, from Columbia and I began to work at Honeybee Robotics, where on a professional level, it was a chance as a young mechanical engineer to deal with different clients, different industries. We were doing work for air conditioning plants and uh, food manufacturers and doing virtual vision systems and end effectors for robots. And we also made a contact through my old boss, Steve Gorovan, with the space agency, with NASA. And uh, NASA at that time was very interested in uh, using robots to construct in space. And the initial ideas for the space station, uh, there were a lot of different ones, but robotic construction was very much a part of it. So we worked with NASA to conceptualize construction processes with robots and to help them set up test beds with industrial robots to test out some of these ideas. And somewhere in that period, and I won't say it was because of NASA, but it seemed to kind of arrive in a parallel fashion, I was exposed to what NASA calls deployable structures. Uh, so rather than constructing a structure in space, you would unfold a structure in space. And that really triggered the kind of initial um, thinking about, you know, what's the, how do you consider deployable, transformable, pop-up uh, objects that change themselves by themselves? How do you even think about that? You know, how do you think about that? My focus, uh, I was, you know, with how I would interact with all of these influences and different tools was very utilitarian in the sense that, you know, if I was had a project where, you know, I wanted to make an expanding sphere of 1,500 individual machined pieces and it had to be suspended and open and close and, you know, which had not been done before, I was kind of, you know, saying, what do I need mm -hmm. to do that? Um, my, you know, my manufacturing kind of partner in this, Bill Record, with this famously named company called Zen Engineering up in Saugerties, New York, he was basically re, uh, sort of re, 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 refurbishing these digital machining centers uh, very much as a kind of a, an opportunity to get, extra, you know, very expensive equipment in some state of disrepair, bringing it back up uh, to working order. Um, he would program in G-code uh, to, uh, to make these parts. I mean, that's, that's still the basis of, uh, of, of machining today. Uh, but at the time, you know, we would together sort of cob together a front end so that my designs would, in fact, flow seamlessly into his machine. So it's CAD-CAM, but it was, there was always a kind of a, you know, somewhat of a kind of a homebrew quality to it, driven by economics more than anything else. I mean, a lot of stuff was around then from the, for the types of things I, was, I needed to do. It just wasn't accessible unless you were working for you know, a big company. Um, and as far as the sort of the, 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 the Hollywood software uh, side of it, and you know, that, that's been a huge kind of uh, very interesting driver to uh, how, uh, how, how computers as design tools uh, get um, play out in, in these other realms. Uh, I mean, I always had a kind of a little bit of a, a ambivalent relationship to it. Uh, on the one hand, it was, you know, I was, uh, I love that, you know, I, I love that capacity to create visions and see them do all kinds of imaginative things and, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it kind of revolutionizes all of our sort of perception of what's possible. And on the other hand, I was always, you know, I was, I was a bit on, you know, uh, the kind of side of saying, yes, but I do it, I do special effects in real life, they have to work.